If you want to know why Dune's world feels alive in a way no Hollywood film like it ever has before, you'll see the reason everywhere. You'll hear it in the score as when it plays, we get gaslit into thinking this music isn't from Earth due to the alien sounding instruments. You'll see it in the Atreides armour that doesn't just look badass, but so functional. If I were getting into a sword fight, I would want an Atreides armour set. The same for the the Fremen and the Sardaukar, both wearing clothes perfect for their people's needs, and that lends the work this real quality. A fantastic counterexample to this is most things Hollywood's produced for this genre, because this attention to realism is something we rarely see. But let's look at 1984's Dune, where we see Fade Rauther, instead of wearing the sensible fabrics he is in Dune Part 2, is wearing a giant plastic codpiece which, other than looking hilarious, looks like something you'd expect to see a model wear as they go up and down a catwalk, not a bloodthirsty killer like Fade to wear as he comes out of the shower. It's bloody hard to nail down what precisely this quality is that elevates Dune, but it's as if all these other sci-fis out there aren't immersive in this way because they're self-aware that they're actually fiction, be it by giving title crawls to fill us the audience in, or having music that, while brilliant, feels composed by a talented musician from modern day Earth, rather than a talented musician from Tatooine, for example. But this wasn't fluke by any means. It was all intentional. Part of Denis' pitch to us was that he wanted Dune to sound like a documentary. As if we had landed on Arrakis with a boom pole and a recorder and everything you heard would sound like or feel like what you'd expect it to sound like. This illusion of a real world, it was created from the top down. While the movie may make it seem like effortlessly achieved, an incredible amount of work went to creating this effect. And if we want to understand how the movie created this effect, uh, we could look, start in many, many areas. Um, we could look at how Dune has incredibly well written lore and you know, how do you write great lore. But I think a way more interesting place to start is how this movie conveys its lore to you. Dune goes out of its way to never tell the audience the things that are common knowledge in this world, even when it could. Like, I'm sure when the Duke and Paul are adapting on Arrakis, people explain bits and bobs, and it makes sense, you know, because they don't know that stuff, but there are so many aspects of the lore that the audience is kind of screaming to know, only the film never conveys it to us. It's left to our imaginations. Uh, we see at the start, for example, that this takes place 8,000 years in the future. Yet why is the technology so limited? Bar the floating ships and the personal shields, it's an oddly minimalistic future tech-wise. This gets us curious, it creates a question we're asking, only we get a little bit frustrated by it because we can't find the answer to it in the film. Oui, oui, uh, look at this lore I'm hinting at, it is very mysterious, uh, says Villeneuve, and that was my best French accent, I'm sorry, I'll never do it again, uh, but Villeneuve tantalises us. and, and we we say as the audience, yes please, tell us that law, to which Villeneuve gives a cheeky smile and says, no. Why? Why do Herbert and Villeneuve restrict information from the audience like this? It goes totally counter to the instinct that, frankly, most writers have to dump as much lore onto you as they can get away with to help you understand the world. Now you could argue this all has the effect of creating a sense of intrigue around things, and while that's very true and that definitely doesn't hurt the film, it's just a bit too surface level. I'd argue that for Dune, the, the most beneficial effect this has for the film is it replicates the feeling that we've been teleported to the world of Dune, making the experience all the more immersive, because like we are in any new country we've just arrived in, uh, we're a little confused. Culture shock is hitting us hard, because everyone around understands the common knowledge except for you, so you're scrambling to try and put together all of this unsaid information. Piecing all this stuff together is part of the hardship of travelling, but then again Again, it's also part of the fun. In a way, all good sci-fi and fantasy plays into this appeal, only something like Dune plays into it with a heavy lean. Now to be fair, there is this one moment from film one that goes against this trend. <laughs> 
without spice, interstellar travel is impossible. But that's the only time in either of the Dune movies something said that would truly be common knowledge in this universe, so I think we can give them a pass on this one little bit. Either way, we now know this fact, but this presents even more questions. Like, okay, they need the spice to navigate space, but why don't they just use computers for that? We then get this. How much will it cost them? Three guild navigators, a total of 1.46 million 62 salaries round trip. So they have human calculators. Interesting, the audience thinks. And by here we've gotten plenty of subtle clues. It's a cultural aversion to technology as opposed to anything else. Like calculators aren't exactly complex tech here. Then we've got the Atreides guard and the Duke wearing very simple fabrics and technology free clothing. And we're starting to piece together that this culture only opts to use tech when they have no other choice. There is an actual reason for this all in the lore, but the movie very impressively has the confidence to never tell us this, leaving it to our imaginations. This approach, it not only engages the viewer in the way any good puzzle might, it reinforces Villeneuve's larger vision of making it feel like we've actually been dropped onto this alien planet due to all of this culture shock, making Arrakis feel even more real than it already did. This is a little bit out of left field, but I can't help but think of Max Payne 3, an exceptional third person shooter that's aged like fine wine, because that game goes for the same approach as Dune. It intentionally alienates the player, although just in a slightly different way, because our protagonist is an American, he's in Brazil, so naturally the people around him are all speaking Portuguese. Caralho! <laughs> It would be really useful if we could just have some subtitles to let the player know what everyone's saying. Only if you turn them on. Yep, uh, the subtitles are in Portuguese too. There's no English translation for this one, so good luck. But this does such an effective job at replicating this feel of someone in a foreign land who hasn't the first clue what's going on and is scrambling to try and understand. Delivering exposition in the Dune way, this plays very well into iceberg theory. Above the water is the lore we can see, and it should be interesting juicy lore, but a great writer will convince you that there is also a great deal more lore hidden beneath the surface, you just haven't discovered it yet. If you can create this feeling, it makes your world feel so much more intriguing and alive. And also notice that you don't actually need to write all of this extra lore, seeing as no one going to be seeing it, you just need to convince people that you have written that law, so you can get away with you know, not doing as much work as you might otherwise need to, because that's all you need to achieve this effect. Uh, films that totally fall flat here are ones like Rebel Moon or Jupiter Ascending. Sure, they've obviously put plenty of time into writing the lore, and yes, they use the old exposition mallet to wallop us over the head with all this lore, but we never get the sense these worlds feel alive, unlike Dune. This raises an interesting problem, because what stopped those crappy films from having a living, breathing world? There's quite a few reasons why, but I reckon there's a big takeaway to be found here on how to write lore well. Going over the actual lore of Dune, millennia ago there was the Butlerian Jihad, where AI created to serve humanity try to overthrow us. It was a bloody war, but humanity won, and this therefore caused society to shirk computers out of fear of such an event happening again. But this caused an issue. How are people navigating through space now we've lost our fancy navigational computers? Therefore, a solution was found to use spice, a drug that vastly expands the human mind, giving people pre cognition, thus making them able to safely navigate space. But spice can only be found on Arrakis. Therefore, this caused the conflict of the main story, as the Harkonnens and Atreides are vying for control over this world, because whoever controls Arrakis will gain a ton of money and power. But because of this spice's effects, when Paul is exposed, he receives visions of a dark potential future with him as some kind of warlord leading some kind of massive army on a galactic conquest. Now all of that lore, it's quite interesting, but have you noticed why it stands out as particularly good? I hope me saying but and therefore increasingly obnoxiously was a good enough clue, because that's it. Great lore is about connections and the quality of said connections. What should happen between every beat that you've written down is either the word therefore or but. And then this happens. No, no, no. It should be this happens and therefore this happens. 
Trey Parker gave that advice in the context of plotting a story, but god damn it if it doesn't work just as well for world building too. Don't say, and here we have a world where water is scarce. Anyway, that's all there is to it, on to the next random piece of lore. Instead say, here's a world where water is scarce, therefore the locals wear special suits to preserve their moisture, and when the Fremen give their own version of a mugging, it plays out like this. You will be well rewarded. What wealth can you offer beyond the water? in your flesh. Water is a borderline currency on Arrakis. They'll kill you just to harvest the water in your body. You also have palm trees outside the Duke's residence, because they require a ton of water per day, so having them is this world's version of buying a Lambo and flexing your wealth. The scarcity of water is just one aspect of Dune's law, just one, but the dozens and dozens of ways it impacts the world, from clothing to customs like spitting being a sign of respect, or biology as mice craft little cocoons to seal their moisture in. It lends the world a richness that 100 otherwise cool elements, yet ones totally isolated, could never achieve. If you're writing a world right now, do this. Take one aspect, then thoroughly think through the ramifications. Uh, to apply this, let's say we have a fantasy where wizards are able to teleport anywhere instantly. This is going to massively change a lot of things about society. Magical security is going to be needed to stop these people from teleporting into vaults and stealing everything in them, and I'll tell you what, these wizards are going to make an absolute killing just delivering letters from one place to the next, because that's instant communication. People can pay a low price for a letter that will arrive in a month, or pay a high price for instant delivery. Uh, militaries will pay wizards a huge retainer just to be on call so they can help communicate in any battle. Maybe the wizards unionise and extort people by hiking their prices. And this makes the upper classes resent the wizards tremendously because no one likes being price gouged. So then perhaps they start making other means of communication like pneumatic tubes, only the wizards then sabotage them and maybe even kill the engineers because they don't want to go out of business themselves. Look at that! That was one world building element I came up with off the top of my head, but in fleshing it out with this technique, we've created a long string of cause and effect to flesh out this otherwise blank world. If you can do that for, say, a dozen aspects of your lore, you'll suddenly find your world couldn't feel more alive. This is how you do great world building. I'd even argue this is the trick above all others for writing great lore. We've all seen those films where the world feels stagnant. Uh, this is why Rebel Moon and Jupiter Ascending had such dead worlds. But another easy to reach example here are the Star Wars sequels. Through these films, we never get the sense there's a larger world beyond what we're seeing. That galaxy feels dead because if something major happened, for for example, you know, I don't know, a, a super weapon being used to kill billions of civilians and causing one of the galaxy's major factions to come crumbling down. What would be the consequence? It turns out there isn't one, and my god does that make the world feel not just so boring, but so lifeless. It's easy to point at the Star Wars sequels, say they didn't have enough lore, then just leave it there and move on. But what I find way more egregious is how because those films leave all of their elements marooned from each other, uh, such as Canto Bites having nothing to do with anything else, uh, or The Republic which we briefly see being connected to nothing else, it's not dynamic. In our world, if something happens here, you can bet there's going to be ramifications over there. But then again, realism itself doesn't actually matter. Uh, look at Dune. It's got a world that's so immersive, yet being able to mind control someone by just using a certain tone in your voice, or Paul taking drugs that gives him precognition, like none of those things are terribly realistic. So what actually matters here? Well, I can't help but think of something Gabe Newell once said about game design. It's weirdly relevant to the idea of building great worlds. And you'd have these conversations where you'd be sitting in a design review and somebody would say, that's not realistic, and you're like, okay. In the real world, I have to write up lists of stuff I have to go to the grocery store to buy. And I have never thought to myself that realism is fun. I go play games to have fun. And so we had to come up with some notion of, of what fun was, and it was the degrees to which the game 
recognizes and responded to the player's choices and actions. If you shoot at a wall, there have to be decals. If you kill a bunch of Marines, the Marines have to run away from you, right? You have to have this sense of the game acknowledging and responding to the, the choices and actions and progressions that you've made. Otherwise, it loses any, any sort of impact. It's not about realism. It's about cause and effect. If you can connect everything as if it's all part of, you know, one grand spider's web, where if one thing happens over here, that will affect four things over there, it creates a kind of ecosystem. If the spice stops flowing, for example, then all interstellar travel grinds to a halt. Therefore, whoever controls Arrakis has a stranglehold over galactic commerce, so that person can make pretty much any demand of the wider galaxy they want. It's not just about world building, it's about every other part of the craft, a verisimilitude, realistic dialogue, like having your characters make decisions which actually make sense. All of this stuff together is what makes a world feel truly alive. And if you want help nailing those parts of the craft, a great book I like to recommend is a story by Robert McKee. Robert McKee's a legend in Hollywood, and his book is filled to the brim with all kinds of writing wisdom, uh, from how to create immersive worlds, a story structure, characters, and it's got the best insight on writing themes I have ever seen in a book. But hey, some of you are probably thinking right now, I'm sure it's a good book, but again, I just, I just don't have time to read that stuff in my daily life. I'm, I'm just too busy to read as much as I want to. And I've been struggling a lot with that issue myself. Like, it's been really kind of annoying for me. And that's why today I'm really happy to share with you a solution I've found to that problem. And they're called short form. The premise is pretty simple. What they do is they take non-fiction works and condense them into a concise summary for you to read. And you might say, okay, sure, that does sound like a time saver, but what's stopping me from going on a blog post or a YouTube video where someone's giving a summary of that book instead? Why can't I just do that? Here's why that won't work. Because what turns short form summaries from being pretty darn useful into being genuinely great is the commentary they add. Here we have the summary of Robert McKee's story, an already very good book, but after every other point, they have other famous writers chime in with relevant thoughts either fleshing out something McKee said, or sometimes actually disagreeing with what's being said. Uh, here we have what psychiatrist Viktor Frankl thinks about McKee's writing philosophy, and half a page later, the writer explains how Friedrich Nietzsche would have fervently disagreed with what McKee has to say about the purpose of storytelling, going on to say Say, if you use rationality to find meaning in life, you're doing it wrong, which is just a bloody profound insight. If you're already interested, please click my link in the description, shortform.com forward slash the closer look, and get 20% off their usual price. But I'm just going to explain how I've integrated shortform into my reading process, so this is how I recommend you do it too, and also thank you shortform for sponsoring today's video. What I do is I still read books, I just don't read book reviews anymore. Uh, what I'll do is I'll look about a book, say, uh, for example, On Writing by Stephen King, then look at the short form summary, and if I see only one or two good bits of wisdom in there, I'll just read the summary and not the book. However, when I read the summary and it's genuinely fascinating, that's when I'll buy the book, and armed with the knowledge and the extra context provided by the summary, I will have a richer reading experience than I would have if I just jumped in blindly uh, into reading the book. And also what I've done, like, I've, I've flipped it the other way, where sometimes I'll read the book and then read the short form summary afterwards, and that is, like, a really good way of cementing what I've learned from the book, like, in my memory. It's, it's a really good way of reinforcing everything you've learned from any non-fiction book. If you're serious about self-improvement and you're not using short form, you're making a mistake. I really think so, because like, if I had to put a number on it, the efficiency with which I learn from non-fiction has shot up by about 40% since I've started using short form, so if you'd like to join me here, do click my link in the description down below, shortform.com forward slash the closer look, and get 20% off their usual price today. Anyway, thanks for watching, keep writing, and I'll see you guys next time on The Closer Look.